Jack, thank you so much for our final, um, we saved the best for last, our final speaker of our speaker series this week. We're super excited to have a representative from the Boilermakers with us today, Mr. Che Rockchild. Um, again, quick housekeeping, uh, put questions or comments in the chat box. I will be monitoring that and I'll read them to our guest at the end of his presentation. Um, and we are recording the session, so I just want to let you know that and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our guest. Oh, first I want to thank again Contra Costa Billy Building Trades Council for helping us to get this speaker series all set up. So, um, Che Rockchild, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Che Rockchild. Like uh, Aaron uh, pointed out, I'm a graduate apprentice journeyman of the Boilermakers Local 549 in Pittsburgh, California. I'm currently serving as, a, uh, as an apprenticeship instructor here at the training center. Um, and I'd like to bend your ears a couple minutes about our trade and, and trades and tr union trades in general. I'm a proud Boilermaker and um, I, I don't have any regrets making that decision uh, looking back. However, um, I'm pro union trades period. So any union trade that you choose to go into that interests you, I'm 100% behind it. So I want you guys to watch this short video. Um, and, then, and then after that, I'm gonna touch on the finer points of being a Boilermaker, joining the Boilermakers, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I just wanna put this uh, in context, first and foremost. There's going to be a shortage of, of good craftsmen going forward. We're on the threshold of a major manpower crunch. All this stuff is coming at the same time. We have the largest uh, oil deposit in the world. A lot of people don't know about that. Uh, currently on site, we're in excess of 5,000 people. Two million man hours just to build this unit. Yes, yeah, Chevron is the number one taxpayer in California. Sometimes we go up to 4,000 people that we bring in for a turnaround. The current challenges that we're facing is the shortage of skilled labor. We're at a shortage nationwide. We're going to be looking at an unprecedented construction boom. We're going to need a lot more boilermakers. The owners, I can tell you for sure, when we get around them, it's all they talk about. It's harder and harder these days to get people to join the building trades in general. It's not for everybody. You have to be willing to work in dirty environments. Confined spaces that you need to work in. There are high places you need to work in. Just not anybody can come out here and do what we do. My priority is to bring talent in. Because this is a career. This is not a job. Boilermakers generally, they take a lot of pride in, in their, their craft. Our skilled mechanics, our skilled uh, supervision, riggers, welders. Uh, I truly feel like I'm making a difference, and that's why I get up every morning. I love being a Boilermaker. Even if I do a good job, it is still not good enough for me. The attitude was, you know, get out of the way and let's go do our job. Just extremely proud of the team and what we've accomplished so far through the, the application of our craftsmanship and our expertise, being accountable, committed to excellence, uh, we are helping to power the region uh, and the country uh, for the rest of the 21st century. And, the, and the, the exciting thing is that we're just getting started. We're at the Torrance Refinery doing a turnaround. We're doing a small revamp of the back tower and it's about 200 foot tall, I believe. Right now we're pulling out tubes and replacing those tubes with new ones. This Torrance refinery here is vital to the whole state of California. And we're working seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day, trying to get it done. A lot of refineries are watching right now, I'm sure. It's the first time Union's been able to come back into this refinery. As we're opening up these vessels, we're, we're seeing how things were repaired in the past that is not up to our standards. I 
I really love trying to stand up to those standards. The spotlight's on us right now. More is expected of us as union members when we come on a job site. And uh, hopefully we can continue to get more work. The work that you do on these job sites, we would like it to be done as if you were doing it at your own house. That way, you know at the end of the day, everything's perfect and it's gonna be good. We are always looking at quality and doing things right the first time. Leave this plant better than what it was when we come. The younger generation is really close to me. Uh, my son is out here with me. His very first job he was on, he was welding tubes in a boiler, and his foreman come to me and told me that he was what was holding his crew together. And I tell you what, that was one proud moment for me. The future for a boilermaker that knows all aspects of the trade, has a good work ethic and high capability, the sky is the limit. I've sat through some of the trainings and, it, I mean, it is impressive. We're developing eight state-of-the-art regional training centers in the West. It's really made our apprenticeship just a lot stronger. I've had awesome training, good instructors. My craft is top-notch. The older hands, they're perfectly willing to take a younger hand under their wings if they know he's, he wants to be a Boilermaker. Some of the services that the Boilermakers provide, you know, the scholarship funds that a lot of people don't know anything about. At our hall, we've got the code right on the wall. We are very serious about this. The training aspects, the classes that are offered at no cost to the members to keep us better educated and safer. And, and it's amazing. I, I, you can't believe how energized these new guys are. You can tell when you go in there how, how much desire they have to learn the trade. And that's what we're looking for. Number one, I'm looking for somebody with a good work ethic. Uh, your thinking skills are very important. Your ability to analyze the situation and look at this hazardous job that needs to be done and figure out how to mitigate those hazards to make it safe so nobody gets hurt. You don't come out here blind and have to learn on the job necessarily. You're gonna have the training, the skill, the knowledge, on what you're doing before you maybe ever even get to do it. Our number one thing is our owners. That's the most important thing to us, and, and this was important to them. Well, certainly working for a, uh, an oil company, uh, you can't afford to start up a plant and it shuts down again because the work wasn't done correctly. Having a skilled workforce is an absolute must when, when it comes to executing projects and, and turnarounds. We've got a couple of companies that are using our people in California and they're just raving about the type of work they do and the quality of the work they do. Quality help. They're getting quality workmanship. They're getting quality craftsmanship. In this day and age, everything is getting harder and we got some of the best young people in the business. These guys are, are top notch. Ultimately, we all want the same thing. We want to go out and build a project. We want it done right, we want it done safely, we want it done with quality. I feel like Boilermakers are using uh, this transition and this opportunity to, uh, to create a new legacy. I've worked around Boilermakers for the last 27 years and had some great opportunities and, and, and built some pretty impressive stuff. And you know, it's, it's one of the craft that people take a look at and say, wow, this, this looks really impressive. Something you can feel proud of uh, when, you, when you go home at the end of the day and say, you know, we helped build this.
all that being said, that was kind of a, a walk in the day of the life of a, of a Boilermaker. Um, everything that you saw in that video was some aspect of the things that we do, whether it's for the refineries, the oil, oil production companies, or if it's for the uh, energy power plants. I mean, we, we go into anything that's a, a pressure vessel, anything that's considered a boiler, um, and that and, and you'd be surprised in the place that you find, a, you will find a boiler, whether it's in hospitals, on ships, um, power plants, refineries, sawmills, you know, uh, recycling centers. You'd be surprised where they would, you will find boilers in general. But boiler just is just a, an archaic term for a pressure vessel of some sort. Um, and anything that has to do with pressure of storage, transfer of fuels, combination of fuels or, or liquids, chemical plants, things of that nature, that's where you'll find a boiler maker. And the environments look basically the same. But let's keep in mind, I wanted to, I wanted to point out a couple of things about the environment. Now, it is a extremely physical job, not to, not to belittle anyone on their uh, capabilities physically or not, but just going into it, you should know that it can be a pretty physical job, not all the time, not every day, but there are times where you're gonna, they're gonna get the butter from the duck as the, as the old saying uh, goes. A lot of climbing, crawling, moving things. Um, there's a lot of confined spaces when we're talking about crawling. These places that we're working in, and these, in the example of the video, um, uh, that refinery, those refiners that they were referring to, these places were not really meant for human occupancy. They didn't, they didn't really have that in mind when they built them. However, they still need to be repaired. They still need to be replaced, things of that nature. So you have to be able to get in there, get the work done, get back out, and do all that safely. Um, there's also having to deal with heights. Um, and a lot of times, it, it's not. It, uh, a lot of times, you'll find yourself in a in a man basket you know, 50, 60, 70, 100, 200 feet in the air doing something on the outside of these, uh, of, of these vessels or these uh, um, structures, you know. Um, not everyone's comfortable with heights. I don't think I was necessarily comfortable with heights myself when I started, but I got used to it. Uh, you get up there and you're concentrating on the task in front of you. You really don't have a chance to overly dwell on where you are in reference to the environment. There's also extreme temperatures, um, um, whether that's environmental, just because it's a hot day and you're dealing and you're, and, you're, and you're working around a lot of metal, or because you're welding or someone else is welding, of course, that's going to heat the metal up. So um, there's, also, there's all types of um, um, issues with that. But like I said, confined spaces, heights, extreme temperatures, you know, being able to get in and out, uh, crawling, climbing, it's, it's physical, it's, it's active. And it can be pretty dirty at times too. Um, the things that you should expect um, coming through the apprenticeship program for the boilermakers is we're going to train you in all processes of welding, all processes, all positions. Uh, that's MIG, TIG, and stick. Um, that's exotic metals from stainless, uh, exotic rods, ink and nail. Um, Anything that in any in any part of the process where you need to be able to weld, we will train you in um, in that aspect. Um, and none of that will come out of your pocket when it comes to materials or training, uh, uh, um, paraphernalia. Um, I mean, there's certain things you should definitely get on your own. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to bring up the list of things like you know you want your own welding hood and you know gloves and things like that when you come into the when you come into the shop because while we have loaners here, I wouldn't necessarily use them, especially not in this current environment with COVID and things of that nature. I kind of leave that stuff where it is and just bring your own in so you know where it's been and you know we'll play it safe like that. Um, but yeah, all process of welding, all positions of welding, um, that's overhead, uh, vertical, horizontal, you don't really do that much flat welding. I mean, if you can do any other position, flat's not going to be an issue for you. Um, then there's also rigging. You're not just going to be welding. There's a lot of emphasis in welding because we need more welders. Everyone, every craft needs welders. Any craft that has welders needs welders. That's, that's whether it's the boilermakers, the pipe fitters, the electricians, the iron workers, they all need it. 
Um, the more welders, the merrier. And I just want to point out that for you young, uh, younger uh, ladies and gents, uh, just having uh, any trade, but it, just having the ability, having the, the ability to weld is going to potentially make you money no matter where you are in the United States of America or the world, because they, they always have a need for welders. So just keep that in mind. So moving on from welding, there's also gonna be teaching you how to rig. And the rig is the art and the mathematics uh, behind hoisting, uh, transporting heavy materials uh, from one place to another, getting things into position. I mean, that goes from everything from uh, a porta potty to a, a 100,000 pound tower. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make a difference. It, it's all part of the art of rigging. And we're, we're gonna, uh, that's one of the things we teach here at the training center is, uh, is um, how to wrap your mind around some of the things that you're gonna have to maneuver and move in the course of your career here. Um, and all that to be said, with the, whether it's the welding or the rigging, uh, all that we're training you most importantly is to be able to do it safely. You know, get all this done safely. Of course, there's other things we train people in, like reading and understanding blueprints, creating blueprints, um, uh, all sorts of mathematics, because uh, some of that, we call it field mathematics, um, because some of that does come into play when you're coming into uh, cutting out shapes and knowing where to place these uh, cuts and where to place your welds and things of that nature. So all that will be shown to you while you're here. I, uh, another thing that I want to say is er everyone has life paths. Like they imagine, I mean, when I was a kid, I imagined that I was going to be a fireman or something like that. And then when I got older, um, I went into the IT. That's the direction that I went to. Uh, my career path was definitely IT. I went to Florida State University for computer sciences. I went to ITT Tech when I came out to California for computer networking. And yet I find myself here some 20 or 30 years later. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because your life path, you, you, you'd be surprised on where it could take you. So don't, don't pigeonhole yourself into anything. Don't pigeonhole yourself into boiler making. I'm just saying that, you know, keep a, a wide spectrum of capable uh, possibilities out there because you never know what might spark your interest once you actually are exposed to it. All right. So, um, Let's get into specifics. One thing people always want to talk about is the money. It's always about the money. So let's talk about the money. Wages for a journeyman a boiler maker. As of January 1st, 2021, of a journeyman status boiler maker, his wages are 49.62 plus six bucks, so around about $55 an hour. And why I say six bucks is because it's a vacation fund that every hour you work, they take $6 from your check and they put it in a, an account that you collect on the first, uh, first, first week of December every year. You don't actually get to take vacation. So they just put aside a vacation fund and that vacation fund at six bucks an hour over the course of the year gets kind of chunky. Uh, I'll point that out. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna tell numbers, but I've cleared eight, nine, ten easily, thousand dollars on right before Christmas. It's, it's a perfect timing type situation. So fifty-five dollars an hour is journeyman wages. Uh, you guys that will be coming in. You guys will be uh, regardless, uh, depending on how you come in or, or where you stand in the pool uh, situation. Um, a first level apprentice comes in at like 30 bucks, 3092 or something like that there. I'm not exactly sure exactly is 29, 30 bucks, but that's, that's a first level apprentice boilermaker. Um, you can also come in as a safety attendant, which is uh, some more of a um, observatory type position in the boilermakers um, because uh, uh, and safety attendants, they tend to, t you know, keep track of like um, personnel going in and out of uh, confined spaces and things of that nature. They keep an eye on, uh, they, they assign them to keep an eye on the bottles for the people who are working inside confined spaces who need oxygen, constant oxygen. So, and things of that nature. And also fire watches for the, making sure that, uh, that nothing's burning up on, you know, and nothing that's not meant to burn is burning up. And they started about 25, 26 bucks an hour. So 
those are the, the beginning numbers uh, for uh, being in the Boilermakers. You can start off as a safety tenant at about 25, a first level apprentice at about 30. And of course, when you get to the end of the game, currently it's uh, about $55 an hour. Um, and I believe we just ne negotiated a $9 raise over the next three years. I think we, so it's gonna be even higher than that by the time that you guys um, provided you come in uh, are graduating. Um, what else is there? Making sure I don't miss anything. No. Okay. It's an earn while you learn type situation. There's no internship in the, in the Boilermakers. It's 6,000 hours on the job training. You're being paid to learn. Of course, there's also an, uh, uh, 600 hours of mandatory classroom training, and there is uh, an online LMS system, learning management system that, that holds the entire curriculum. You're going to be having to go through that too. There's a lot of schoolwork involved. There is definitely um, more than what some would like, but you're, you're preparing for a career. You're not, you know, this is not just meant to be a job. This is, this is your pension. This is your retirement plan. This is your annuity. This is all the things that you're not really thinking about at 18, 17 years old, but you will be thinking about it in your mid thirties. When, it's, when, you, when you're tired of working and you're ready to throw in the towel. Um, training center locations. So we have the training center, the original training center, which is where I'm at right now, is uh, in Pittsburgh, California. Uh, this building is probably 26 years old, but we just bought a building in Benicia that is being retrofitted currently. Uh, so that's gonna be the next uh, training center when I say within the year, we'll be moving out that way. And, uh, we can go ahead and sell this building. There's um, restrictions because of COVID um, on, you know, on usage of the training facilities. For the last two weeks, we've been shut down completely, uh, two or three weeks now. And that's out of, uh, out of concern for COVID. But this is an essential field that we're talking about. The production of oil is, a, is, a, is an essential field. So it continues to move forward regardless of what most other crafts or what most other fields are doing. There is no work from home type situation. You need to be out there, you know, your hands on, on location, uh, doing the work that needs to be done. So just want to point that out. But the training center currently is shut down, uh, I'd say for at least another two weeks, probably another week to two weeks before um, they will um, uh, Contra Costa re restrictions are lifted, I'm hoping, and then we can move forward with our training here. And of course, if you're a member uh, of Local 549, um, the training center is always open to you. It doesn't cost you a thing. As long as you're a member in good standing, you can come in here and burn up as much metal rod, scrap metal practice. We will, you know, that is completely open to you as long as uh, for, uh, the operating hours of the, uh, of the training center, which is normally eight to five on most days. And I think uh, two nights a week, we stay open to like 9 p.m. for those people who are working, who want to come down to the training center and train because they don't, they don't have the opportunity to do so during the daytime because of hours. Um, equal opportunity employer. I want to bring this up because uh, historically speaking, there's been a it was, and I'm not sure how prevalent it is anymore, but there was a, a disparaging uh, amount of inequality when it came to pay rates between the genders or even the ethnicities and things of that nature. Uh, uh, being in a union, being in this union, there's, there's none of that. If you reach a certain level, you get paid the exact same amount as everybody else who is at that level, period. But it makes no difference what gender you are. It makes no difference what ethnicity you are. You get paid the same. And I'm not sure that was always the case in every craft, but I definitely want to point that out in this craft. Um, that, 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 that is how it is uh, uh, that's just how it is. I can't think of the term that I was thinking of at the present moment, but that's just how it is. And I just want to point that out because we're trying to get a lot of um, uh, more women involved. Uh, then we have a we have a couple of organizations where they're really pushing for the women to get involved in the trades in general. And you wouldn't necessarily think that um, some people would not necessarily think that Boilermakers was a trade for the for the for the lady folk. But 
you'd be surprised. Some of the best boilermakers that I've worked with are women. You know, they have this, this attention to detail when it comes to welding that some dudes just do not possess. So they excel in that area. So don't count yourself out just based on gender. Um, hmm. I think I hit everything. You absolutely did. And ladies, listen up. This is our 11th or 12th speaker. And every single one of them has said that women have a better attention to detail. Just saying. <laughs> so uh, don't count yourselves out. Um, I have said this many a times that I wish that I knew about these opportunities when I was their age. So take full advantage of it. Um, thank you, Chay, though. That was a lot of information. That was great information. Um, do you by any chance know what the, the men to women ratio is currently now? Do I know what it is? Not, not, not specifically, but I will say that the men definitely majorly out a number of the women. But I'd say within the last year, um, it's actually surprised me. I think we've gotten about a, a dozen women and that doesn't seem like a lot, but for us, that was a, that was a shocking amount. You know, that that in the shop every day practicing welding, and they're involved, and and I can really appreciate their their difference of opinion. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, how many out? How long, on average, do you, does it usually take to complete that six thousand hours? Do you think? Uh, that depends on the person. To be perfectly honest, um, I completed it in four years. Um, I've seen people completed in five or six, depending on how often, because we, um, we, we solicit your work for you. You don't have to go out and do anything. You know, you get, you come in here, you sign on the list. Once everything's, once everything's in order, you sign on the list and then the dispatcher will sit back and go down the list and assign people jobs and he sends them out. So at the same time, he can call a person up and, and they can deny, they can say, Hey, I don't, I don't want this job. And you know, they can sit home, but we can't, you know, that's just their prerogative. So um, depends on how fast they want to work it, you know, uh, but I say average four and a half, five years. Okay, great, great. Um, what is one skill? I know that in the video, it said that they're looking for someone who, um, you know, is, is willing to learn and stuff, but what is one skill that the students can kind of work on right now and maybe bring in to being a boiler maker, um, whether it's time management, what anything. Well, um, basic. Uh, well, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure I would constitute a skill, but it surprises me. Um, and I guess it's not really something that even I use as a child. But it surprises me how many people will come in here and they fail. They don't have like. The ability to read a tape measure, you know, and that's simple mathematics. I would think fractions of, of that of that sort and thing, but um, and they never had the experience before. And I'm thinking, you know, but then it, then I have to remember that they previously, I don't, I'm lately uh, over the last couple of years, I think that's kind of turned around. But previously speaking, they took a lot of the trades out of high school in general, so they didn't really get that exposure, you know, so basic math skills and, 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 and curiosity, you know, ask questions, just, you know, it, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't really want them. I, I don't really feel the need, I should say, that they come in here with any pre-existing skills. Sometimes a clean slate's better, but um, just come in here with some basic common sense, some go get them, you know, some interest. And I think you can fill in the blanks. Awesome. How about, um, can you talk to us a little bit about drug testing? Definitely. So um, to even come into the hall, to become a member, you have to, you have, immediately they're going to give you a drug test before you can even come in the building um, uh, to use the facilities. Uh, and most, which is our governing, one of our governing programs, um, is going to give you an annual drug test, uh, urinalysis. Um, and that's going to be every year. And you need to keep that up in order to stay on the, the good graces list in order for you to be eligible to be sent to work you got to be able to keep this uh, uh drug test clean um uh each contractor the places that you're going to be going to working at they also 
can and normally do give drug tests. They're a little bit more invasive drug tests, I would say, because they're going to do hair follicle type situations, and that goes back further than uh, than the urinalysis does. But um, and that's every job. Every uh, I, I would say at this point in time, if any facility that you work on, they're going to want a drug test. And if you happen to get hurt, or if anybody in your crew happens to get hurt while you're on the job, they're going to drug test you again. Everybody, not just you, it's just everybody who's in the vicinity, everybody who's on your crew is probably going to get drug tested again. So you got to stay clean um, when you're in the in industrial uh, construction um, you know, arena. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what does like an average day or week look like? What do the hours typically look like? That's all over the place. I mean, yeah. I've had, I've, I've had jobs that were four tens. I worked Monday through Thursday, 10 hour a day, and had three days off, and those were pretty sweet. And then you had jobs where it was the normal, you know, uh, um, eight hour shifts. Uh, but the, the, I won't say the normal hours, because normally they start like really early in the morning. So you usually get to work at six or 7 a.m. and you're getting off at three or four in the afternoon. Um, but uh, so you can have everything from four tens, four days a week, 10 hour days, to seven days a week, 12 hour days, you know, and and basically you're going to work, you're working, and then you go home, shower, eat, sleep, turn around, come back to work, and you keep that up for a couple of weeks. Now your bank account's really gonna appreciate that. Your life, on the other hand, is gonna come to a stop because <laughs> you're not gonna have the time nor energy to do much else. But you know, once that job is over, those jobs usually don't last that long. You usually, you know, I think the longest I've been on a job where they were running us seven days a week, 12 hour days was like six weeks. And at the end of those six weeks, I had enough money to go on vacation, probably for the rest of the year. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, for those six weeks, it was it was just work, eat, sleep, work, eat, sleep, work, eat, sleep. Nice, nice. Can you talk a little bit about the graphics that are on your background? It's uh, the websites and and such. Oh yeah, good. I'm probably see yourself? I, I, I can't <laughs> see myself, so I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Change my if you view. put your if you put yourself on speaker view, yeah, you should be able to see it. All right, so um, it says right there our address twenty one uh, ninety one P my way. Um, if you have any questions, the training office uh, um, uh, email address is right there. Feel free to send any and all questions to that email address. That www boilermakers local five forty nine org is something we just started within the last year or so. Something that I'm trying to keep up with. Uh, and it kind of kid kind of keeps our members uh, apprised of all the training sessions and anything of um, note that the members should know. And some and some of that information on there is just um, just information for food for thought for anyone who happens to just be uh, perusing through the net. Uh, Western States JAC is the governing program for our apprenticeship program. Um, that's the that's who is registered with the National Department of Labor. And that's who controls our apprenticeship program and our apprenticeship standards. Um, BNAP, the National Apprenticeship Program, is what our, our curriculum comes from, our, um, our LMS, Learning Management System, that's online that you, anyone who becomes an apprentice will have to go through and complete. And most programs is uh, mostly like OSHA training, um, who controls our OSHA training, who controls our drug tests, things of that nature. And uh, picture in the back right there is kind of what the building looks like um, out here in Pittsburgh, California. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, can you tell us what's the coolest project that you've ever worked on? What's the, I don't know, the most, yeah, the coolest project? Um, the one that stands out to me, that I have to say that I enjoyed the most was in Lodi, Lodi, California. Uh, that's right north of Stockton. Uh, if you're driving up towards Sacramento on I-5, right after you pass the last exit in Stockton, going before you hit Lodi, if you're looking off to your left-hand side, you're going to see a big metal structure. And there was a power plant that we built. I, I want to say it was like 2011, maybe 2012, something like that. Uh, they already had a, an existing power plant, power unit there, but they built a bigger one because they, you know, California is greedy for electricity. So the more power, the merrier. Uh, and this is, you know, prior to the, the solar um, expansion that they had 
Um, but nonetheless, uh, so that was the, the project that I enjoyed the most. And that's just because I was in it from the beginning to the end. I got to see this, this, this massive structure start from concrete level to what it is today. And I, as an apprentice, I had my hands in all parts of it because the journeyman, <laughs> because the journeyman uh, don't mind putting apprentices into the work because that means the more work I do, the less work they do, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, so with all fairness, um, I, I I got to I got to play as a journeyman uh, as an apprentice, and I mean just saying, I mean we had lifts that took two three cranes, uh, multi pick uh, lifts that were hundreds of tons uh, and and you know in the 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 procedure the preparation for uh for those lifts is astounding the, the amount of mathematics that they put into the planning of these type of lifts i mean when you see these things in the air these things look like ocean liners you know they're huge and you got all three of these cranes and these things have to work in perfect coordination or things can get ugly you know, so that, I think that was uh, my favorite job. That sounds super rewarding. Um, so you have a unique story in which you have learned working with your hands and you have learned, you know, in traditional, you know, education setting in a, in a university. Um, all of our students that are on the on the call today are all in career technical education some pathway whether it's engineering or the building trades um what do you feel is the benefit of you know learning with your hands on and getting in there and getting dirty in the nitty-gritty versus you know learning from a book which neither are, are better or the other but um i went like i went the, the traditional route first and I, I have the utmost respect for it. I mean, to this day, I still, I, my computer skills serve me well in my hobbies, um, but I just don't use them as a profession. Um, I don't think I was exposed. I don't even think I was aware, to be perfectly honest, uh, of, of the trade side of things when I was coming of age. Um, I'm pretty sure I wasn't aware. I mean, I probably drove past power plants and refineries every day and didn't even recognize what they were. So I think both of them are necessary uh, to, one, to one degree or another. Um, I think I prefer, I've come to prefer this side of it because while I didn't, while I didn't mind, you know, being in a cubicle all day and, you know, coding and things of that nature, I find more I find it to be more um, satisfying to actually get my hands involved in something, to make something with my hands, something that I can show my friends and family, you know, later on down the line and, hey, I helped build that, you know, this, you know, this, it's, it's pretty awesome to be able to drive by something that you've built or been on a project at and you don't get that same satisfaction uh, in my previous field, you know, you did your job and you were behind the scenes and things got done, but it didn't have that same satisfaction for me. So, I mean, if you drive down the Antioch Bridge and you look to your right, you see all those peakers, all those metal structures. I was part of the projects that built those, you know? So I think it's more satisfying. I find it to be more satisfying. Now, don't get it wrong. I still, I still enjoy my IT aspect. I mean, even in this training center, and I'm supposed to be a Boilermaker apprentice uh, instructor, um, I spend a lot of my time still troubleshooting pro computer problems in the building. So it's, uh, it, it doesn't go away. You just, you're just multi-talented, multi-skilled. There's nothing wrong with that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question on here. Um, let me see. What is the average age that you, that people usually enter? Is there an average age of people entering the, um, I can't say there's an average age because I mean, I've, I've, I came in at like 30 and I'm pretty sure I was at that time, I might've been one of the younger individuals, but since I've come further into the organization, I've seen people coming in 50 and I've seen just last week, four individuals coming here and they were 18. So I don't think there's an average. I just think um, that when people become aware 
or when people become interested, they come in. It, it doesn't, as long as you're physically able to do the work, I don't think there's a. Equal opportunity. I love it. Awesome. Um, let me see. There was another one here. I'm going to put it. Um, talk to us about the best part about being in a union. What do you love about it? Aside from the phenomenal wages. <laughs> um, um, there's a sense of brotherhood, sisterhood um, in, in, uh, among the ranks. Um, so there, there is that. Uh, of course, there's the protections that we have because you're part of an organization. And uh, when it comes to workers' rights and uh, you know, fair treatment on the job and job environments and what they can and cannot do or you know, uh, environments that they can and cannot place you, you know, you, you're protected, you know, and if there's an issue, then the legal team gets involved and, you know, you get to continue doing your job without the stresses of having to fight every single battle or every time you feel like you've been wrong. So there is that protection that does, uh, I, I appreciate it. There is a, there's a sense of, you know, protection. There's a lot of companies out there where, you know, they, uh, once they get tired of you, they fire you and you have no recourse. Have a good day, you know, and it's not, it's not quite that cut and dry as a union member. You know, they have, they have to go through, they have to dot their I's and cross their T's if they, if they want to uh, uh, get rid of someone for whatever reasons. Awesome. Protection. I love it. Um, you might, the, the video might have had this, but um, just want to reiterate if one of our students, once they graduate from high school, they're ready to come and join. What does the process look like? Do they just come sign up? Is there an entrance exam? Um, we're one of the few, uh, one of the few that I know of that does not have an entrance, entrance exam. Um, I did have a sheet on that, but um, no, we don't have an entrance exam. You can come in any day of the week and fill out a membership application and get a apprenticeship application. There's, there's, there's nothing, there's no reason why we can't give it to you or that you can't come fill it out. As long as you're 18 and you have a high school diploma and a valid identification, um, any day of the week, you guys can come down and fill out an application. Of course, immediately after you finish the application, they're going to send you the email for your drug test and your OSHA 30. Um, the drug test is necessary in order to get in to use the facilities, and the OSHA 30 is necessary to complete in order for you to be eligible to be sent to work. And that's just safety. OSHA 30 is all safety. You need to know, um, you need to keep yourself out of harm's way because it is a hazardous environment that we work in. And uh, the more you know, the safer you become. Awesome, awesome. Everything sounds super exciting. So we have just a couple of minutes left, students or teachers, if staff, if we have any other additional questions for our guest. Um, it sounds like the Boilermakers have their hands in a lot of different aspects and a lot of different um, opportunities, I should say. And uh, I love that it's right in our backyard, right in Pittsburgh, you know, right here, homegrown, <laughs> which is awesome. Been here for like 30 years, so yeah long before I got here. Yeah, awesome. Um, hang on a second. Can you talk to us? Um, again, we appreciate you coming in and, and talking to our students. Is there something that, you know, maybe you hope that our students are taking away from you coming and visiting us? Is there one point that you hope that they walk away with? Hmm. Um, we're interested in the community. We're interested in you. You're, you're the next generation. You're the guys and gals that are going to take over for us when we get out the way and we're retired in wheelchairs and you've got to push us around. So um, we're definitely interested in you. We want to, uh, uh, regardless of what, like I said earlier, regardless of what trade or uh, academic uh, um, that you chase, um, I can't think of the word right now, but I want you to succeed, but uh, we're definitely um, interested in the community and the, and the younger generations because we need to pass on this information. We don't want to lose it. You know, Boilermakers originally started from blacksmiths. And, you know, back when they were making, you know, uh, 
horseshoes and iron uh, um, armor and swords and blades and things of that nature when that was what they were creating and then you had the industrial age that came along and they started making ships and you know so that's what boilermakers the, the heritage comes from and we need we need we need the community to be interested to keep it around and to be able to pass it on so we want you guys to know that we're interested in teaching you as much as possible because that's going to make you more successful and it's going to make our community more successful and potentially our country more successful. Love that. Love that. Um, we had a question come in that says, does being bilingual help on the job site or in, in the, in the trades? Definitely. Definitely. Sometimes, there, 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 is, there are places that you can work where there is definitely uh, the language barrier or, or difficulties, not necessarily the barrier, uh, but some difficulties. So being bilingual, yeah, that, that's, that's a plus. That's a plus. I wish I was bilingual right now. It was a position I'd love to pick up, but not as of yet. So if we were driving an area right now, like literally today, what's one, what's one place that um, your boilermakers are working on right now? Anywhere local? Right now, Gateway. Um, it's the, uh, the facility, the power plant is right by the, uh, the Antioch Bridge when you're crossing over going toward Rio Vista. Uh, we got a couple of crews out there right now that are doing some maintenance for PG&E. Um, so if you're crossing that bridge, just look over, not to the fishing side where it was out on the docks fishing, the other direction past the boat uh, parking area, and you'll see that facility sitting over there and, and we, have, we have a couple crews over there right now. Awesome, very cool. Well, students, again, I'm gonna give you one last chance to throw anything in the chat box that you want. But um, Che, we can't thank you enough for given us this opportunity and hopefully when the world comes back to normal we'd love to stop by see the training facility um, maybe have you come in and see some of our awesome classrooms and some of the work that the students do um, again like i said they do the, the career technical education so they're very hands-on when they're in the classroom um, i know especially for our building trades um, they work on some pretty cool projects as do our engineering students so um, it's it's pretty cool so um, again, let me just check the chat box. Nope, we look good. I thank you so